Okay, so I think it's time so we can start. And uh, I am glad to introduce you, Dr. Daniele Spinozzi, who will talk about uh, regenerative medicine. Uh, before starting, uh, just a few words about uh, Dr. Spinozzi. He graduated uh, at the University of L'Aquila in biological sciences, and then he got his uh, master degree in, um, micro in bi biological sciences at the <laughs> University of Parma. In November 2020, he completed his PhD and obtained his uh, doctoral diploma in uh, medical sciences at the University of Leiden with a thesis based on the um, transplantation of cultured um, uh, cornelian and endothelian cells. Now he's working on um, as a postdoc uh, researcher and is working on uh, decellularization and uh, repopulation of uh, aortic and uh, pulmonary heart valves at the Leiden University Medical Center. So, uh, Dr. Spinozzi, you can start with your presentation. So, thank you very much, Elena, for the introduction. It is a pleasure for me to be here today with you talking about regenerative medicine. Also, because I completed, as you say, my, my bachelor degree in the University of L'Aquila. So, for me, it's a sort of going back to, to my roots. So today we will, uh, we will see this journey of regenerative medicine, how it works to go from the lab bench to the actual clinic. So how can we make a treatment that will be used afterwards for regenerative medicine, starting from uh, actually basic research. Regenerative medicine offers basically real solution to patients who are suffering from chronic diseases. So instead of using therapies to relieve, for example, pain and symptoms, regenerative medicine can provide the means to repair sometimes damaged tissues, sometimes even small clumps of cells, and sometimes even all organs. There are many ways to regenerate cells, tissues, and organs. We have, for example, specific cell types that um, are going to influence the innate capacity of the body of regeneration. We can use gene therapy that basically consists in usually taking cells from a patient, a patient that has a genetic, um, a genetic defect um, in his cells and then reprogram these cells with a functional copy of the same gene in order to have him express or her express the, um, the functional gene and the functional protein that is actually needed. We can also use tissue or organ specific stem cells. So that's a very powerful technique. We can take a bunch of stem cells, repro reprogram them the way that we like, differentiate them the way that we like, and then use them to patch some specific organs or even to resolarize an entire organ. And another method is to use organ scaffolds. So we have scaffolds of different biocompatible materials, and we can seed on top of them either differentiated cells or against stem cells. Tiny bit of history about regenerative medicine. So the regeneration of body parts, it's a common phenomenon in nature. It happens in many animals. In humans, it happens, but only till a certain age. For example, if you have a severe fingertip, it can regenerate until 11 years of age. And it's also known from literature, from mythology. So here we can see the myth of Prometheus um, in which the, the liver was eaten by an eagle and then it regenerated overnight. So that's a, a small uh, historical deviation. The term regenerative medicine was found for the first time in 1992 in a paper by uh, Leland Kaiser. It was describing the future of different uh, multi-hospital system, and you already figured out almost 30 years ago that regenerative medicine, as we actually know it now, would have been the future for hospitals in terms of treatment and therapies for patients. But the idea of creating artificial organs is even older. So in 1938, this, there was this book from Alexis Carell and Charles Lindbergh called The Culture of New Organs. 
So Alexis Carrel was a Nobel Prize for his uh, discoveries and work in vascular surgery and vascular anatomy, while Charles Lindbergh, some of you might know, was the first man flying above the Atlantic alone. What was the connection between the two? Lindbergh had a sister that had a genetic cardiovascular defect. And because uh, he was very wealthy, so he ended up working in the Rockefeller Center together with Karel. So he went to this doctor and said, look, my sister had this kind of problem. Can we sort it out something? And within the years, within three, four years, they basically set it up um, the first uh, system ever to keep an organ perfused outside the body during surgery. So that is actually the very precursor of um, yeah, organ transplantation as we know it right now. This is a partial list of first in regenerative medicine. So we can go from the bone marrow transplant and then we have stem cell lines, the creation of the first cloned animal, Dolly, the sheep, you all know that. And then going through different steps till the 2009 date where the first solid organ engineer was performed by recycling a donor liver. Also in 1967, there was a milestone for European regenerative medicine from a doctor here in Leiden. He set it up Eurotransplant. Eurotransplant is basically now an association of all the transplantation centers in different European countries. Um, it is estimated that since the foundation, almost two, 200,000 people receive an organ via uh, Eurotransplant. And at first it was only for kidneys and then other organs were added. So let's start make this treatment. Let's see what it takes to make uh, a treatment for regenerative medicine. All the treatments are called ATMPs. So advanced therapy medicinal products and are medicine based on genes, tissues or cells. And we have different types. We have GTMP, so gene therapy medicinal product, this is what I was uh, saying before. So you have uh, a cell, you have a patient that basically have a non-functional copy of a gene. Then you take out the cells from him, you reprogram the cell with genetic engineering, and then you re-inject the same cells um, with a functional copy of that gene. Then there is CTMP, so somatics, cell therapy, medicinal product. Those cells, uh, this type of therapy involves cells that are basically not used for the original scope that are present in the body. So for example, I'm taking cells from the bone marrow, uh, stem cells from the bone marrow, reprogram them in another way, and I use them to, uh, for example, resolarize a kidney. And then I have a CTMP. And then finally, I have a tissue engineer product, so a TEP. In this case, um, it's more or less like the CTMP, but uh, including a tissue. So it is, you know, a higher amount of cells, more organized, for example, heart valves, for example, skin, those are all tissue engineer products. The European Medicines Agency, so the EMA, is responsible for the evaluation of these ATMPs and also for marketing authorization afterwards. There is a EUA regulation 2007 that is responsible for the ATMP specifically. And uh, here you have a few questions that help e EMA to decide whether the treatment is corresponding to actually, is this a treatment or is it a drug or it is something to be transplanted? And then you have also different categories of ATMPs, as I said before. So the, the questions can be, for example, are there any living cells? Or uh, does the, the ATMP uh, contain uh, a certain quantity of a specific component, for example, DNA? Um, is the, um, uh, for example, the, the cells substantially manipulated? So uh, yeah, it, the, the shape, the, the organization is modified, the genetics is modified, things like that. According to answer yes or no, these questions, you have a list of the products that you are going to have in the end. 
To produce an ATMP, all the processes must be aseptic to prevent contamination. And you have a UA directive also for that in 2009. So since ATMP is a medical products, they need to be manufactured under good manufacturing practice license, so GMP license. And here we see a, a typical scheme for an ATMP. So you collect the tissue or the organ or the cells from a donor or a patient, and then you process it, you perform some tests, probably you harvest if you are talking about cells, so you expand the ATMP that you have, and then uh, you store it. So you have to demonstrate also the stability. If the organ, the tissue, or the cells have to be transplanted in a patient, it might happen that they have to stay for some period in a fridge or wherever. So with antibiotics, how are you going to store it? After the final test, the product is ready to be released, and then it goes uh, to the patients. How to get an organ to do all these things? So organs origin can be basically animal or for human donors. Animal organs, the sources are animals used for animal testing in the lab, for example, mice, or for other types of organs and animals. Um, organs can also be collected in a slaughterhouse. Uh, so I work with, um, yeah, with porcine organs, and those are collected from a, from a slaughterhouse. Organs used for research do not have a specific regulation. They can easily uh, be bought online. For example, this company, uh, this company Innovative, that you can see here the logo, uh, typically sells all type of organ that you may need. Um, while regulation is, of course, stricter for organs used in xenotransplantation because you have many complications, mainly because of immune rejection, but also uh, legal complications. About the human organs, uh, you can have a donation that can be post-mortem in case you're talking about a donation of organs like eyes and the heart or from live donors, for example, kidneys. Soon as the donation process starts, the donor becomes a number. So the only information that are provided uh, to the recipient of this type of organ are the sex, uh, the date of birth, and the cause of death. That's basically it. And some analysis regarding microbi microbiology and virology testing. Of course, best quality organs are allocated right away for transplantation uh, or clinical application for regenerative medicine. And other organs rejected for any reason for transplantation. And with any reason, I intend the fact that every country has its own reasons, so it can change among countries. So these type of organs are used for uh, research purposes. Um, in the previous slide, you saw um, um, the picture of a European Association of Tissue Bank, because Tissue Bank is an organization that provides donor screening, processing, storage, and distribution of the tissue. So all the analysis that I talk about, all the microbiology testing, all the uh, sometimes even the excision of parts of the organ are performed in a tissue bank. When the organ arrives there, so all the analysis are performed, microbiology, virology, and macrostructural and microstructural. So for example, if you have uh, a heart valve, usually you get a form. When you receive a heart valve, you get a form with the shape, with the drawing of the shape of the heart valve, and also the areas where there was, for example, the uh, calcification in the valve, so a process that occurs during the year, or a small lesion, or any type of abnormality that a tissue can have. And here we see how um, a tissue bank works. This is specifically is an eye bank uh, in Rotterdam, where, where I used to work. And here you can see on the left, uh, you have this, uh, this section of tissue to take a layer of the human cornea and the corneas on the picture on the right are stored in, an, in some culture medium. What do you actually need to produce an ATMP? Normal labs are not enough. Uh, ML1, ML2 culture rooms are not enough. You need something very specific. You need what is called a clean room. 
So a place that is very aseptic and all with almost no contamination in it. And we'll be back to that later. You need specific equipment for manufacturing. So you need, for example, specialized machine that you don't usually find in the lab. Uh, or of course, incubator if you're performing cell culture, but everything as sterile as possible. Equipment for analysis, so not only for manufacturing. Uh, again, if you're working with cells, uh, you need a microscope. You need, for example, a spectrophotometer. Those uh, are all equipments of which a clean room uh, alternative exists. So again, you can order things that you would order for the lab. You need a specific um, type of machine for the clean room. And then finally, uh, cryopreservation. So if you're working with tissues and cells, you need a big place where, where to store it because uh, you might have, for example, bags full of cells um, and you have to store them for a long time. So a cryopreservation unit is part of the, of the clean room facility. This is where actually, yeah, the magic happens sometimes, sometimes not, but yeah. It is a facility used as a part of a specialized industrial program also. So it's not only for uh, scientific research, it's also for uh, basically making other products. And they maintain a particularly free air using uh, usually EPA filters, but also more specific filters. And everything that is inside the clearroom, so walls, equipments, other materials are used to minimize the generation of particles. As I said before, everything that can be used in a clean room has a clean room uh, specific product. So even pencils, even pens, uh, a watch, uh, a clock to hang on the wall, everything that you can imagine has a clean room alternative. And also the equipment, as you can see, is designed to generate minimal air contamination. Because what is the agent that brings the higher risk of contamination? People. So people are a huge source of contamination for those type of rooms. And clear room workers must attend before starting a GMP course before being admitted. And in this course, there are several chapters just to teach you how to get dressed. And not only with those specific vests, as we can see here, me and my colleague, but also the exact procedure of the steps that you're going to take before entering the clean room. So for example, if you're putting the gloves before a vest or the other way around, you have to start the process all over again. And also the bins that you see here, the flow cabinet, everything is designed to guarantee the maximum sterility. Here, I have a small video of about a couple of minutes. Uh, we can show, I can show you the, um, facility, the clean room facility at the UMC. Uh, sorry, Daniele, I don't know if we need the audio, but we cannot hear it. Uh, sorry? If we need the audio, uh, yeah. you have to share system audio when you share the screen, because otherwise we cannot hear it. Um, so so advance? Uh, it's easier if you just re uh, unshare the screen. Okay. Just a second. Yeah. Then uh, try to share the screen again, and there should be a slider that says include system audio. Okay. Uh, okay, shall I play the video again? Mm -hmm. Do you hear it? Um, I don't hear it. Do you hear it from your computer? 
I can I can hear well I can hear it from here of course. Okay, but do we need the audio? If we don't need, we can go. We yeah, um, well, not really. It says that doesn't say a lot of interesting things. So I'll just I'll just play. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, it was more to show you how the, the structure was and how many things um, should pay attention when you work in a, in a career room. So how sophisticated the whole process can be. Um, so let's see if I can go the next slide. Yeah, okay. So after the production, our ATMP is completed. Uh, the product is released for safe and clinical use. As I said before, um, the release is pretty complicated, not only because it's a very long process, so it can take up to two weeks uh, waiting for the microbiology and virology analysis, but also uh, because the list of criteria is common for all the countries, but for example, the definition of the final product is not. In Europe, despite EMA regulation, every country has a different interpretation of what an ATMP is. Um, a common example I always make is how Germany and Netherlands intend the use of uh, desolarized heart valve. So for Germany, um, desolarized heart valve is just an ATMP period. That means that requires a whole bunch of stricter regulations, while for the Netherlands, um, there are many questions still to be asked because, for example, the, the disorized heart valve basically has no cells because all the cells are removed during the process. So if there are not any living cells present on the tissue, is that a tissue product? Or um, so something that requires a less strict regulation, but still to be intended as an ATMP. So all those questions that are asked along the way make the process very slow. For example, in the US, Food and Drug Administration, so FDA, introduced three different categories of GTMP, so of gene therapies. You have therapies for um, uh, specific diseases like retinopathia, uh, for uh, diabetes and things like that. So those are listed with a specific characteristic. So the amount of paperwork that you will face, it's enormous and yeah, very long. Also to, to come up with a common plan, um, an association of 23rd European Research Intensive Universities has been made. So this LERU, uh, League of European Research Universities, the, purpose, the purposes are clear. So to influence the policy, both at the European level and also member state level, develop best practices and also relevance for all these universities. This is because biomedicine groups have a major role in making ATMPs. And also many clinical studies are performed, but very few products are sufficiently developed to reach the patient. Uh, just because of the things uh, that I mentioned before about the bureaucracy, uh, about the different interpretation that every country has of the legislation. So this is um, a list, and this is the list of the European universities that are actually taking part in this um, LERU association. 
So from now, I will start. Um, I will start giving some examples of therapies that are currently used um, in all fields. So I will start with gen with gene therapy, and then I will go through some cell therapies and uh, organ tissue and organ transplantation and tissue organ resolarization and so on. I will start with a uh, gene therapy. Uh, used for uh, curing muscular atrophy. This is uh, this is some news that I read just yeah this morning. So I thought I would include it in the in the presentation. So spinal muscular atrophy (SMA) is a genetic condition that makes muscles weaker and can cause problems with with movement. And usually it's linked with a very short uh, age expectation. Main therapies right now are developed towards alleviating symptoms. So they are not uh, curing the disease, it's just alleviating symptoms. But a baby girl of three years old has been treated with a pioneering gene therapy combined with hip surgery. So um, the combination of these two therapies was uh, because as all the people affected by SEMA, uh, this condition is uh, a genetic malfunctioning of a special gene that encodes for, for a protein. Um, and she also she was also born with uh, hip problems that would impair her to walk. Uh, here you can see uh, from, a, from a newspaper, and sorry, it is in Italian, uh, but yeah, post-surgery rehab is going in the right direction. So the kid is standing on her feet and soon, hopefully she will be able to, to walk again. So people affected by SMS, as I said, have a deficiency of the SMA protein, so survival motor neuron, primarily due to mutations on the SMN1 gene. The protein is also encoded by the SM2 gene. So the gene therapy consists in an alternative splicing of the gene in order to make a functional protein. What is an alternate splicing? You have the sequence of the gene, that is formed by different pieces of sequences that are called exons. So uh, an exon can be formed, for example, of by 20 nucleotides or things like that. Um, this new therapy uh, basically uh, inject some nucleotides in the patient, and then um, the nucleotides acts in a way that the sequence of the protein is cut differently. Therefore, the SM2 gene is able with a different length, with a different size of the genetic sequence to encode the functional protein, something that usually wouldn't happen if you have a non-functioning uh, SM1 gene. So the first dose um, has to be administered as soon as SMA is diagnosed and then three more doses within nine weeks, and afterwards one dose every four months via injection into the, the spinal canal. So let's see, um, hopefully this, uh, this will be the, the first case, um, the first case of this type of gene therapy in, in such a disease. Then going through cell therapy, one of the most uh, important ones in the, in the last year was CAR T cell therapy against cancer. So some of you would have heard already. It is a type of treatment in which patients' T cells, type of immune system cells, are changed in the lab. So they will attack cancer cells. Again, we take cells from a patient. Um, we modify genetically in the lab and we insert this, uh, the gene for the CAR receptor. The CA receptor is called a chimeric receptor because it can do at the same time the binding to the cancer cell and the activation of the immune system. So these cells are expanded like a million of times and then they are infused back in the patient. When they are in the patient, the first thing they do, they go look for the cancer cells because the receptor is designed against the antigen the cancer cells. So it's very tumor specific. In this case, the uh, CAR T cell binds to the cancer cells. 
sends a signal to the immune system and say, look, this cell has to be destroyed. And therefore, the, the, this, yeah, uh, basically cancer cells are finally killed thanks to this, uh, this approach. It is currently used against certain blood cancers, like for example, uh, at the UMC, um, there were first patient treated um, uh, who had lymphoma has been treated a few months ago successfully. And every year about 15 patients will receive uh, this cell therapy. It is being studied also in the treatment of other types of cancer. This is, for example, the list of uh, CAR T cell therapies uh, right now in clinical trials at different stages against breast cancer. So there are about 20 therapies at different stages. Solid tumors are a bit more difficult to be uh, played with uh, CAR T uh, cell therapy because of the macro environment of the, of the tumor, but we are getting there. This is the project I'm working on. So that's a draft project because, uh, and it means, as Elena said, uh, desolarization and repopulation of aortic and pulmonary homograph. So currently use heart valve sulfur for calcification and progressive functional de degeneration. So after a while, they don't work anymore. They're suitable for use in older patient, but for pediatric patient, they represent an issue because the valve is not able to grow together with the patient. So it doesn't support the somatic growth of the patient. At the LUMC, uh, we perform desolarization of these valves so that we can reimplant them in, pe in pediatric patients afterwards. Desolarization is basically the removal of all cells from the heart valve, keeping the main structure intact. It is based on two studies that were performed at the UMC, two European studies, in which there were about 35 implantations of different heart valves. So uh, we use those studies as a, as a blueprint to perform our decelerization ourselves. At the same time, we're also busy with kidneys. So um, kidneys are some of the most versatile organs for regenerative medicine. They can be used as a whole, but also a small part of it. And my colleagues in 2018 published this paper about disorized kidney used as a scaffold for repopulation with stem cells. Disorization protocol can take a lot, of, a lot of time. It takes about one week, 10 days, and we use soaps and detergents to destroy cellular membranes. In this case, arterial venous entrances, let's say of the kidney, I use as a connectors for tubes that will be part of the perfusion system. And the perfusion system pumps inside the kidney those soaps and those detergents for 10 days. And they also take out all the, the garbage, let's say, that comes out from the kidney. And here we can see a very beautiful glomerulus ready for resolarization. Resolarization happens with a perfusion system that is completely closed. So we have here a series of pump connected with a series of tubings and a cellular bag. But at the same time, you need a lot of cells because um, the cells that will adhere to the desolarized structure of the kidneys cannot be that many. So in order to have the highest amount of cells to have a computer resolarization, you need a huge amount of cells, talking about 30, 40 million of cells. And where are you going to take them? So you use stem cells. Um, you expand them using this uh, specific protocol. This is for uh, transforming stem cells into endothelial cells. And afterwards, you perfuse back again in the organ. You perform the... the um, so-called organ in culture. So this is a kidney emerged in organ culture medium with the cells pumping constantly in. And here, my colleagues saw the endothelial cells uh, that we can see here in green for the expression endothelial marker are present in many sectors of the kidney and some of them are still uh, even proliferating, the ones that you can see in purple. 
The final test was to check whether this kidney was also functional after resterization. The answer was yes, although for only 20 minutes. By functional, that means also, amongst other things, that reacquire the ability to circulate blood. So the further step would be, of course, to increase the length on this time and also to check uh, whether at another temperature it can be also more feasible. Also at LUMC, uh, LUMC from 2007 as performing pancreatic islet transplantation. So pancreatic islets regulate blood levels of glucose. Beta cells especially produce insulin and are destroyed by the immune process in type 1 diabetes patients. So this is what LUMC uh, is doing since 2007, transplanting pancreatic islets in patients affected by type 1 diabetes. But this isolation protocol that you see here from this picture requires up to eight hours of hard physical work, like hard for real, that you have to activate all those machines and all those pumps yourself. And it is conducted by at least four specialized workers. So it's also something that now in COVID times, uh, you would like to avoid, although the structure should be as sterile as possible. That's why colleagues are working on an atomized automatized system to work to isolate pancreatic islets. This, this system is called PRISM, so pancreatic islet separation method. And it's the first closed system in the world for performing automatic islet transplantation and islet isolation first. Uh, it takes four hours, so half of the time, and you just have to set up the machine um, in the morning when you enter into the clear room, and then the machine does everything by itself. So something very simple and something very useful for uh, diabetes uh, therapies. You might heard also in the news about this kidney xenotransplantation. Xenotransplantation, we mean the transplantation of an organ of one species into a human recipient. And in this case, there was a pig kidney transplanted into a human without triggering immediate rejection by the recipient's immune system. That is the main issue for those sort of transplantation. The recipient was a bread then patient with signs of kidney dysfunction. But for three days, the new kidney showed ordinary urine production, as you would expect from a normal kidney. So again, how would you demonstrate that a kidney works? Circulating blood and producing urine. The kidney was coming from a genetic, genetically modified pig from a company called Revivicor. Uh, those pigs are called gulf safe pigs because basically they are uh, pigs genetically modified in order to knock out the pig gene for a, a carbohydrate that is present in um, pig cellular membranes that triggers rejection. The carbohydrate is called alpha-gal, so the name, gal safe. And here you see a scheme from uh, the company itself. Uh, so you, you have a pig cell, pig cell genetic engineering, and then you, uh, yeah, you have a genetically modified pig that can be used for several types of, of transplantation. And then something uh, I always like to, to show uh, is about head transplantation, uh, because yeah, it is something quite interesting. And also since many years, uh, surgeons and uh, researchers are trying to, to see if this ultimate dream of transplanting a head is actually possible. Now that almost every organ, uh, can be transplanted in the lower part of the body, only the, the head and everything is, is actually missing. Uh, so it, is, uh, it was a very um, consistent topic in the first years of the 20th century, also with Frankenstein movie. And there were some uh, experiments, so the first experiment about blood vessel reconstruction and in the 50s, there was first transplantation of a dog's head onto the body of another dog. It lasted for about a month. Um, and then in the 70s, 
uh, with the development of new immunosuppressive drugs that was the first transplantation in primates. So four heads transplanted into four primates' bodies. But those animals, uh, although the heads were actually functioning, so the eyes were moving, uh, animals could chew, um, the animals died because of their very high dosage of the drugs. So this experiment was called cruel, was defined cruel. And for many years, head transplantation was not even tried anymore. Also because there was a quite important and solved issue, how to connect the spinal cord between the head and the body, the, the body of the recipient. In 2013, Dr. Canavero claimed that he solved the issue. So he was finally ready to perform first head transplantation in humans. And he even found a patient able uh, to join this, um, this type of surgery. Uh, was a paralyzed Russian man uh, who was yeah, paralyzed since uh, he was born. But later he changed his mind also because of the continuous postponement of the surgery. So Dr. Canavero was always was continuously saying that he needed more time to tune the technique. Uh, he needed more time, more time. And in the end, in 2019, uh, the patient gave up. And therefore, um, the, the surgery did not happen anymore. Also, because not only there were a lot of disagreement from the scientific community, but there were also major ethical, legal, and psychological issues. Ethical, ethical problems were, for example, how to get an informed uh, consent. Or, for example, is it good to have one body for uh, have such a transplantation and therefore saving just one person while one body have many organs so those organs can save more people? And also psychological issues in the sense of how the, um, yeah, the new patient will accept the new body. So the, the person who had, had the head in the previous body, how will he or she accept the new body? So those questions were, were still unsolved. Actually, they, they still are. So some take home messages from the presentation of today. Regenerative medicine is both the very near future for the treatment and also the actual present for many of them, for a wide range of pathologies. It's a, it is a scenario that paves the road also for a better application of personalized medicine. So imagine all the things that you, all the therapies that you can have with combination of genomic sequencing of um, metabolomic data and things like that. The use of organ of animal sources could also solve worldwide donor scarcity. If, uh, of course, uh, many results like the, the kidney transplantation will come. And I'm talking about worldwide donor scarcity because when I was working with corneas, uh, I remember there was always this uh, thing that basically there is one cornea available about 40, uh, for 40, 50 people in need. So there is a huge, there is a huge shortage of organs for, for transplantation. Many investments, of course, are needed for GMP facilities, but also for uh, the so-called cells hotels that are actually a thing. Uh, in Leiden, for example, there is a cell hotel where many, mainly there are iPSCs, so inducing pluripotent stem cells that are just resting there in bags and ready to be uh, differentiated and transplanted for the patients that are in need. So again, something very uh, personalized in terms of personalized medicine. And together with this, there will come new ethical aspects, uh, also need for regulation that will arise in the upcoming future. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you like, please uh, follow my scientific communication page uh, on different social media. I will leave here the, the logo. So thank you, Daniel, for your uh, interesting presentation. I really liked it. And um, if you have any questions, you can uh, ask him.
So, okay. Uh, there are a few questions uh, in uh, the chat, so I will uh, read them. Mm -hmm. uh, Marco asks, um, do you think the future will be 3D printing organ scaffolds instead of decellularizing and recellularizing them? Uh, so yeah, I think it, it's, um, it's very organ dependent because for example, with kidneys, um, it is something that is already done. So it's something that is already going through in uh, experimentation. And they actually use organ scaffold uh, that are therefore um, ready for printed with cells seated on them. Um, but for example, um, since I'm working with heart valves, uh, I can say that in that case, it would be always best to take uh, um, yeah, the, the real deal, so the, the tissue itself, and then performing first a desolarization and resolarization. Because um, the, um, the, the kidney has a completely different structure. It has formed by different microstructures. So it has the glomerulus, it has uh, arterials, endothelial uh, pieces of tissue. Uh, so it is also easy to uh, make an organoid uh, and then seed cells on it. While for uh, bigger pieces of tissue like a uh, heart valve would be, it's, it is still better to have um, the, the piece of tissue itself. It depends by the composition of the matrix. It depends by many things. But yeah, it is something that is uh, already, that people are already experimenting with. So, Again, I'm going back to the personalized uh, medicine. It really depends by the type of pathology, depends by the type of organ that you need, uh, and then you can choose the, the best way. Okay, thank you. And I think Michaela has a question for you. Yes. Uh, Thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. Um, my question is, how can you direct the right type of cells in the right position in a, a decellularized organ? Since there are many different kinds of cells, I think, no? You know, in an organ. So how do you direct and, and let's say make the right position for the right type of cells? Yeah, that is yeah, that is one of the main issues that is actually involved in uh, resolarization of organs. Because as I said before, you need um, a very big amount of cells to let just a fraction of them adhere. And usually, cells recognize the substrate that they that they say that they like most by the interactions that it will create with the matrix that is beneath. So. Um, for example, again, for the kidney, you uh, perfuse the kidney with, let's say, 40 million of cells. They can be a different type. And then uh, you expect that endothelial cells will find uh, the best connection with a matrix that fits an endothelial cells, mm -hmm. um, while uh, mesenchymal cells will fit, uh, again, the best matrix for mesenchymal cells. Uh, for example, with um, there is a, a cell therapy that is used on uh, corneas pathologies. In this case, cells are injected uh, in the eye right away, so with the syringe, and then the patient has to say with the with the eye facing the bottom. And this is because in this case, gravity will help endothelial cells to best adhere to the surface that it's beneath. So you rely on physical forces and biomechanical forces that usually occur between the cells and the matrix beneath. To check whether this happened or, or not, um, as I showed before, you, yeah, you just cut the kidney or the organ that you need and you check whether the cells adhered or, or not. But yeah, it is one of the biggest issues because again, you need millions of cells just to be sure that probably a tenth of them will adhere to the to the correct part of the organ. Thank you. And if I can, uh, yep. another question. Um, 
since the cancer cells are very, you know, heterogeneous and also some antigens can, it could be expressed by, let's say, normal cells. Uh, how do you choose the antigen to which um, the CAR T cells should be directed? Yeah, also in that case, um, you have, um, I think you, you pick the, um, the, the panels of, of antigens that are mostly known, uh, and then you design uh, a chimeric, uh, um, a CAR receptor against them. Uh, the CAR receptor itself, it is specific, but it's not, uh, let's say, super specific towards one antigen. It has also a various range of antigen that it can uh, basically link to. Uh, so for example, for breast cancer of the, all the, those therapies that, that I showed before, they actually arrived to the fourth generation of CAR T cells therapies because the receptors are actually four present uh, on the membranes of the cells. Uh, so I think you, it is, for some things, it is a sort of error trial, a trial error process. So you first try something, then you see it doesn't work, and then you add several antigens. Uh, but for the rest, yeah, you you have to find a good balance of all the antigen that uh, uh, cancer cells can have, and eventually put them together in a in a single receptor. So it it is very hard. And it's also why uh, usually solid tumors are more difficult to target with that type of therapy. Thank you. Okay, so we have another question from the chat from Annabelle. And she asks, uh, are, the, are the IPSC derived cells for recellularization taken from the same patient? Uh, not always, uh, they can also be both. Uh, for example, I know for heart valves resolarization, uh, there is a company um, here in the Netherlands, it's called Encardia, that actually makes uh, those IPSCs for um, any resolarization you need. So it can be from, from the patient itself, uh, but most of the time, since they are commercially available, uh, you also want to go for something that is safe and is well documented. So if there is the possibility, usually uh, researchers then tend to buy them rather than taking them from, from a patient. And uh, one last question from the chat, from Marco. He says that maybe it's a philosophical question, but uh, would you consider that a head transplantation or a body transplantation, if the person resides uh, in the brain, it would be the latter probably? Yeah, that, that's one of the ethical problems that this type of transplantation brings. Um, because yeah, in the case of that Russian patient that was about to undergo the surgery, he had, um, he had, of course, the paralyzed body, so it was his head onto the body of, of someone else. But usually, yeah, the, the person who gives the body, well, not usually, always, is a dead person. So also legal issues are a problem, not only uh, philosophical issues, because who is uh, the identity of that newborn yeah, creature? So is it still the person who has the head or is still the person who was who was the body um, I think yeah it uh, it requires a lot of uh, specific re regulations because it's it's something completely yeah out of the ordinary and then it's probably also you know breaking a tiny bit uh, those sort of intervention because yeah also in my case I, I wouldn't know if uh, the identity is the, the one of the head or the body. So yeah, I think uh, the, yeah, the, the person with, with the brain, so uh, with the head, but yeah, also because, I mean, the other person is already dead. So once he's dead, he cannot resuscitate uh, things like that. So I don't know, but it's something that um, it's interesting to ask ourselves. 
Okay, so thank you. Are there um, any more questions? Okay. So I thank you again for your presentation. Thank uh, you. Really interesting. And um, good afternoon at everyone. Um, good afternoon at everyone and see you